tyrannical parents have this terrible way of invalidating you as a kid and then leaving you unable to validate yourself long after you've grown up and away from them. Some people will become angry and tyrannical themselves. Some people suppress all that, still stuck in their conditioning that if they're just nice and helpful enough, people will love and respect them and they'll be safe. But if you tend to people please and walk on eggshells for others, you've probably noticed that the love and respect from people that you're trying to get is not what you get. Instead, even though it feels like it's going to bring trouble, what's needed is to start bringing forth your real self. My letter today is from someone I'll call Jimmy, and he writes, Hi Anna, my father came from an abusive household and then went to Vietnam. He has PTSD from both these experiences. I've got my fairy pencil. I'm gonna circle things that I wanna come back to on a second reading, but let's read through and see what Jimmy's got going on. Okay. The most present symptom of his war-related disorder is his startle response. He could turn from okay to distraught at the drop of a hat, literally. There are a few episodes vivid in my memory when my sister and I were just terrified. In general, he ran hot, anger and dismissal being his usual response to most things. Tantrums were and still are frequent. I couldn't even have a conversation with him. I still can't. On top of just being scary and unpredictable, he would also invalidate my thoughts and feelings. Almost every time, and would even go as far as to insult me, criticize me. One time announcing to the family while at dinner that I, his 15 year old son, should have been born a girl. I've shared this with friends while laughing, trying to make light of it. But as I type this now, I'm tearing up sad for the young man at the dinner table who felt ashamed and unsupported, afraid to be himself, afraid to express himself. I think that might be the center of the problem here. It continued into my 20s and it's still a thing today. Luckily, I only see my parents maybe once a year now. My father finally admitted a couple years ago that he just can't do family. Good for him. My mother suffered depression somewhere along the way in all of this. I remember how sad she was, how overwhelmed she was, just tired, fed up. For a couple years there, they were fighting a lot, yelling. My mom left him for about a month when I was 12 and the world turned upside down for my sister and me. I'm 37, I have never married but have had many romantic relationships. A few of them lasting a couple of years and a bunch of them just a couple of months. I don't think I've ever taken it slow when first meeting someone. I immediately latch on to them when they give me a dose of love, affection, validation, companionship. I stopped drinking three months ago, but I had been drinking since I was a teenager. With the exception of a month during 2020 after a, a, a it says OUI, but I think that I call that a DUI, dr driving while intoxicated. I've drank almost every night since I was 21. As I venture into sobriety, my childhood trauma is becoming harder to ignore, harder to live with. Yep, that's right. I have made my, the best use of my people-pleasing and eggshell walking talents. I'm an entertainer, a musician, and I started my own house painting business several years ago that has proven successful, though has been overwhelmingly stressful. I can't tell if my drinking has helped with the stress or made it worse. <laughs> Putting other people's problems on my plate seems to be my calling in life. Sarcasm, I take it. Making their problems go away and becoming their hero is my chosen path to achieving happiness, and I'm realizing how unsustainable it is. I've always thought I was patient and understanding. During a rough mental health patch, a while back I attended a weekly men's support group where we practiced good listening, compassion, empathy. I felt good about it. I felt ready to be a better partner, be a better friend. I think I am. I like that group. I struggle with anger issues of my own. It's pretty bad. I've managed not to let it rear its head in romantic relationships and I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm writing to you because of my most recent romantic relationship. This young woman who now I am convinced is on the autistic spectrum came into the picture this year and has taken me for a hot, cold, tumultuous ride down lover's lane and I'm left frustrated, alone, and unhappy with myself after her most recent exit from my life. 
I had my sights set on this woman since first noticing her at a show a couple years ago. Slowly chipping away at getting to know her, getting her to let me into her life and finally dating her has been a process, but I did it and now I wish I hadn't except she did help me stop drinking and the intimacy between her and I in the memory is one for the books. <laughs> Your videos inform me of limerence. I feel now I could have possibly made up an entire relationship in my mind that wasn't really there. Interesting. A connection based on hope. No doubt an insecure, anxious attachment. This girlfriend told me she couldn't trust me. If there was something she was doing that bothered me, I wouldn't say anything until much later. I'm guilty of this because of course I'm afraid that if I bring it up, the relationship could possibly end and then the world ends with it. I can't tell her if her default general dissatisfied attitude is in part due to her autism or if it's because of me. She's always been really blunt, brutally honest, and terribly insensitive. I want nothing more than to help her. Ooh, what a juxtaposition. We'll come back to that. I want to be the one who helps her, which is a problem in itself, much bigger than I could have imagined. Though she's abrasive and hard to read, I really adore her. I wish I didn't. Maybe I don't. I don't know how I feel. She drives me crazy. I'm upset with myself for letting myself be treated poorly and for sticking around, waiting for crumbs, as you put it, savoring each juicy little morsel, creating a false sense of security around them. Maybe she's right for not trusting me. In an attempt to move on, I'm going on dates with new people, probably a little early. I'm so desperate to get her out of my mind that I'm willing to tiptoe cautiously into someone else's life. Is that wrong? Should I sit with sadness, my prolonged grief for a little longer? I want long-term love. I want to give it and to receive it. I don't want to keep going from one woman to the next. As an alternative, I'd at least like to be happy on my own, which I'm definitely not. I'd like to not feel like there's something missing. Yes. I'm having a hard time letting go of my ex, and I don't know why. I know she's not a great fit for me, but it kills me that I can't be the one. Yeah. I'm already jealous of whoever she dates next. My codependency is so blatantly obvious, and I'm embarrassed, ashamed, down. This is not the man I want to be. Some years ago, I remember being in the pits of depression around a similar relationship that had ended. And I had reached out to my parents. Yes, it was that bad, he says. I was 30, a heavy smoker, heavy drinker, heartbroken, lost, explaining to my mom how unhappy I was. She didn't know what to say. My dad grabbed the phone and butted in. You wanna talk depression? Jesus, don't let a woman get you down. You don't know what love is. You're right, dad, I don't. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Anna. And that's from Jimmy. Oh gosh, I'm very moved by your letter. Um, let's go through what you told me. <clears throat> I do get a feel for what's going on here. All right. Father came from abuse, went to Vietnam, had PTSD, was angry, couldn't do family, and just invalidated the crap out of you. Why he did that, who knows? We could pick it apart, but the fact is it happened. And so you described yourself. You're sad for the young man at the dinner table who felt ashamed, unsupported, afraid to be himself, and afraid to express himself. And I would just say, the first time I read your letter, before I read it aloud here, when I was just like reading letters to pick some that I would read, I thought, that's kind of what it is, how you get in relationships. Maybe it's always that with all of us. But I just, I think you're a good writer. I think you have a lot of self-awareness. There's a lot of places where you say, I don't know how I feel, maybe I've got this all wrong. But that's self-awareness too, to just start to sort of notice where you have a, a fuzzy thinking area. Ashamed, unsupported, afraid to be yourself, afraid to express yourself. And uh, what's cool about this is those four words kind of point to the opposite of what your healing is going to involve is going to be freeing yourself of shame so that you feel good finding support so that you feel supported, feeling confident to be yourself because you like who you are and you don't worry that some dark side of yourself is gonna come out and ruin everything, and free to express yourself because what you want and how you feel is now respected by you as worth expressing. 
You are so right that in bad relationships, expressing yourself and saying how you feel could make the whole thing go away. And that's the whole thing about walking on eggshells that we do. Like we're trying to hold a relationship together artificially by hiding how we feel and who we are. And I thought it was very interesting that this woman said she didn't trust you because you would blow up later about stuff. You didn't say anything bothered you. And that makes total sense because in a strictest sense, you're just not honest. You know, you're laying traps for somebody. So that's really good input that, that she gave you there. For you to be trustworthy, you need to be more open about how you feel about things, including when it bothers you. When you love somebody, when you're mad at them, like you get to express that. And if you're mad at somebody all the time and they don't want to deal with it, then it's not a good match. I do think that especially after you, you will have worked on yourself, there's enough, there's so much goodness in there. You know, somebody, somebody good and cool and nice and who loves you will be there and you're not going to have to pussyfoot around. They're going to be really glad you love them and you feeling that for them and expressing it or you being disappointed. Like somebody who's into you, if you're disappointed and you express it, they're there to talk that through and sort of see what's up with that and see if you guys can get to the truth together and resolve it. That's what somebody who's into you does. And I just want you to like plant the seed that you deserve that. You deserve a good relationship. And the word deserve is tricky because just because we deserve, we deserve things because we're beautiful, dear, you know, people. We're human. We deserve it for that. But sometimes we're not getting it because we're self-sabotaging. So sometimes I think people bypass that by going, I deserve something better, which you didn't, but often we do. And I do. And I've tended to take deserve out of my vocabulary because it's, it's just something we do sometimes to elevate ourselves over the aspect of ourselves <laughs> that is creating a problem, right? But I deserve better. It's not untrue, but you know what I'm saying. All right. So you're 37, never married, lots of relationships, a couple years, a couple months. And you, you really want the real one now. So I like that about you. That's a good thing to want. That's a, that's a healed desire. I like it. And um, you stopped drinking three months ago. Congratulations. I'm sorry. That's huge. That might be the most significant thing here. It's totally normal for people who had a rageful dad to drink. And um, it sounds like it got to be a problem. you had been drinking since you were a teenager and you drank almost every night since you were 21. And now that you're not drinking, your childhood trauma is coming up. And you know what? That is great news. It's great news if you support yourself with tools that help you handle the emotions that are happening. So some people do that in therapy. I love this men's group you went to. Like it worked for you. I love that. I wonder if you could go back right? Um, if you can't go to that, I wonder if you could go to a, well, AA. <laughs> if you drink and you want to stop, there's AA and there's a lot of support there. And as people will tell, you know, some people who don't like it will be like, oh, they focus on God or oh, people will hit on you and all of the above. But you get to be you and the 12-step program is a way, it's a, it's a path towards facing what the problem really is and trying to be better. And that's totally where you are. It's a noble and holy place that you are. And I hope you will support yourself, you know, royally with people and a path that will help you. You might have to, you know, test some things out for a while if you don't know what that is. You know, try those meetings. Um, you know, there's so many things that I've tried in my life. Different um, therapies, approaches to healing groups, athletics, uh, books, 12-step uh, fellowships. You know, I've tried all these different things. Churches rejecting church. I've tried everything and trying is legitimate. Trying is legitimate to go and kind of feel like, when does it resonate with this thing you're looking for? And it gets you closer to becoming who you really are. It just does. This is so good. We have to, you know, like to heal, we have to get free enough, unrestricted enough that we can go out there and try things, try dating people, try breaking up with people, you know, try different things. So you've tried drinking now, you're trying sobriety. I think sobriety sounds like a great idea, just from what you're saying, from the programming here, and also that you have a lot of anger, and you're like, I haven't brought it on the relationship yet, but it sounds like it's, it sounds like it's brewing, right? I mean, who gets through a traumatic childhood without anger? And who doesn't screw up their relationships with that anger? So you have a chance now, you're single, you have a chance 
to get out there and face your anger and find a healthier way to deal with it. And all of the suggestions I've given you, they're very good. Also, gosh, my membership program, gosh, come be with us. You can do the daily practice. You can take my courses. You know, we have a way to process emotions and support each other. That's totally what we have here. So definitely want to mention that, <laughs> not sell it short. It's the thing I believe in most. I created it because it's, it's the path that helped me. So, you know, we'd be very happy to have you. And so let's see, you thought you were patient and understanding. Actually, I bet you are. I bet you are patient and understanding and people are complicated and you're angry and you're difficult and you're a little limerent sometimes and you walk on eggshells sometimes and just all of it. It's okay to be complicated. When we're healing, what we're doing is we're shifting a little bit from the negative aspects of our complicated nature, strengthening up the positive ones. Everybody has positive and negative. We're born like that. And we're all sort of like, you know, working out, fighting that battle of, of the good part of us to try to help it win, to try to help it overcome the part of us that's, you know, mean spirited, lazy, procrastinates, you know, puts people down, whatever, whatever your things are. We're all working on ourselves with that. And it's a good thing to do. It's totally positive. And when you're starting to feel like really sick of yourself, like when you describe this, that's um, in 12 step world, that's kind of what I would call the six step place where you're just like, we're entirely ready to have God remove our defects of character. Entirely ready, like I am so sick of how I get and the pattern I'm repeating. And when I've been in that place, I think everything's terrible, but I look back and I'm like, everything just turned, the page turns to a wonderful place. When you get to that and you act on it, you're just like, that's it. I'm willing to take action for this to go differently. So you're doing that. I love that you're doing that. All right, so there's this woman. You say you're convinced she's autistic. Maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe, I just ask a little bit. You didn't tell me anything that was very persuasive about that, but you could be right. And But it didn't come from her and it didn't come from a, you know, a neurodevelopmental evaluator, you know, I don't know, but, but here's the thing. She just was kind of mean to you. She wasn't very warm or kind and it hurt you all the time. And you worked really hard to have her. And sometimes, like sometimes people just do that. We like to chase a little bit. And then if our parents didn't validate us, we'll go all the way to Timbuktu, you know, chasing somebody, even though they're not treating us very well. So eh, that's what we do. In my dating course, you could learn, you know, if you get into the membership, you have access to all my courses. In the dating course, there's a lot of material there about how to really define what it is you want and decide where is it? Are you gonna really go the extra mile to make it work out? And when are you just gonna go, oh, someone isn't kind to me. Someone constantly makes, you know, hurts my feelings and doesn't call me back. No, that's on my list is like, no, that's not gonna work for me. That wouldn't work for a lot of people. Um, but we fit ourselves to it because, because love is scarce. And, you know, that's how we feel about it. But love will remain scarce so long as you keep fitting yourselves to crap someone who doesn't love you. And, you know, love is not just a thing people say, it's a verb. It's where they do show up for you. They do return your phone call. They do care about how things affect you. So you didn't have that. And you have, yes, insecure, anxious attachment. Welcome to crappy childhood, fairy. No problem there. You get to, you get to be with us. There's so much we can do to overcome the limitation of that, to find partners who can meet us halfway on it, who accept that about us. And, you know, it's, it's okay. It's how it goes. It's why we're here. Some people have said, I think this whole channel is about anxious attachment and that, that maybe so, that could be true. But you know, we look at it from a lot of angles. We look at it through the nitty gritty of daily life and not just how we attach to partners. We, we look at all of it. Okay, so yeah, if the relationship ended, you felt the world ends with it. There's a word for that and it is abandonment melange. And Pete Walker defined it. You might want to read his book, CPTSD, From Surviving to Thriving. And he talks about abandonment melange. And the first time I read it, I was just like, that's exactly what I've had basically since I was 12. I was literally abandoned when I was a kid. And then I was emotionally abandoned again and again as a kid, as a teenager, and as an adult in relationships. It tends to be a repeating cycle, doesn't it? 
And so I have this reaction to abandonment that can be really vicious. It's worse than what a, it's worse than what normal people go through. I became aware of that. You know, it was like the end of the world. It would just feel so bad. And I want you to know about that concept because sometimes if you can name it and go, oh, I'm having abandonment melange, you know, when it's like, this is so bad, I'm, the world is ending. It's like, ah, that's abandonment melange. It's a thing. It's not really happening. The world is not really ending. What's happening is a relationship that's not very good is settling into its natural shape, which is not together. And in the long run, it will make total sense that it didn't work out. Very rarely do we end up you know, hooked on somebody who was terrible for us, for real, in the long run. If you're, if you're limerent and serially limerent, you do it again and again, probably what would happen is you'd get limerent about the next person and forget about this one. Or they'd have this little place in your heart, but, you know, it softens. It's not, this is not the nutritious, lovely love that you need it's, it's your chain getting yanked by your own attachment wounds. Somebody comes in close, they pull away, and it's like, I always, I always think of that when they have a bull with a ring in its nose and you can yank it and the bull will do anything you say. And that's how it feels sometimes when your attachment wound is just like driving you to hang on to something that feels miserable. So it's okay. Said she's blunt, brutally honest, and terribly insensitive. I wonder if people have said that about me, but... It's not nice for you, um, but here's what's interesting. So you said, she's really blunt, brutally honest, and terribly insensitive. I want nothing more than to help her. Okay, there's the codependence. She's insensitive, therefore you wanna help her. Yeah, see that little twist that your mind just made there? Not like, I wanna protect myself. I would rather be with somebody who was sensitive and gave a darn about my feelings. Your mind doesn't go there. It's like, I know, I'll help her. And the fantasy is that we can change them. So we go in, we're just, we're like searching the horizon. Is there anything that I could construe as a brokenness about them that I could help them with and then they would love me the way I want to be loved? And does it ever work out that way? It doesn't. So codependence, you you've maybe have heard some of my content about that. I make videos about it. I've done a webinar about it. And I, I just think it's one of the most difficult things you can have. People don't really realize that. They're like, oh, I'm a little bit codependent. Codependence will suck the soul out of you. It'll, it'll leave you alone and broke for the rest of your life. So you don't want to do that. It's so important to become your full and real self. It's so important to express yourself so that you are no longer suppressing who you really are, you know, going, I'm not angry. I don't need anything. <laughs> Who believes that guy? You know, it, it creates a weird energy. And the only people who can tolerate it, see, perhaps this woman is autistic and sometimes autistic people, um, because of what they, the cues they read and the cues they don't read, they can tolerate that kind of thing. You know, who I would go for is people who are high all the time. They can they, they don't notice either that you're being grabby and intense on them. They don't really mind. They're very relaxing to be around, but boy, do they break your heart. You're just really confused about what it all means, and that makes sense, but what it means is it sucks. <laughs> if your relationship feels terrible to be in, it's not a good relationship. And so, you know, we sometimes go through all these mental gymnastics to try to understand, but why are they this way? And what could I have changed about myself? But in the end, if it's miserable for you, it's just miserable for you. Now it's true that some people could be acting on their trauma. You, for example, so much that a perfectly good relationship, you know, you just could never be happy. But I would just say, well, that's where you are now and losing that relationship might be necessary to face what's really going on. There's so much to face. There's what you told me about your dad, there's so much to face there. And you've been drinking it away. You've been chasing women to make it go away. You know, putting your hope in something that was, that was always gonna make life a little, a little nicer, a little warmer, a little more convivial, but it's not gonna fix you. It's not gonna fix the thing, you know? That's, that's not what's coming. So it's good. It's good to be single and it's good to be sober. That's a really good place actually to be doing the work to figure, figure your, I say figure out. I don't think it's very intellectual. Face, to face what the pain is, to face what it is that you've done in your life that maybe was self-sabotaging. Like it's delicious to face that stuff when you're using tools that you like and appreciate. And when you're with companions who are doing it or have done it, 
who are totally supportive that you're working that path too. So I really encourage you. I just think you're doing a lot of good things here. Right now you're ashamed and down and not the man you want to be, but I think that's your fuel. That's the way that you feel that way is very connected to who you can be. You're, you're like this close to seeing what it is that you're trying to get free of and facing it really, facing it really, taking stock of it, acting on it. You can do that. I did it and I cannot recommend it enough. So you had said, oh, this thing. Okay. You left us with this thing. You were 30, a heavy smoker, heavy drinker, heartbroken, lost. You called your parents because you thought they would be like, ah, oh, Jimmy, it's going to be okay. We love you. We know you're a good guy, but they didn't. Your mom was just like, I don't know. <laughs> what was it that she did? And she didn't know what to say. She didn't know what to say. Okay. She didn't know. So yeah, I know what you say. You're just like, that is so hard. You're in a hard place. You know, we love you. We stand by you. I guess I've been saying it in this letter, right? I'm saying it on behalf of the whole community here, the commenters, we love you and we stand by you. We want you to have what you want and need, and we think you can have it. So, um, but your dad, you want to talk about depression? Jesus, don't let a woman get you down. You don't know what love is. <laughs> that could be the line in a play. I think you're a good writer. You're a vivid writer. And I appreciate that. Um, so you, you shall know what love is. May you, may you find it and start growing in your knowledge of what love is starting now so that for the rest of your life, you can deepen that knowledge. If anybody here wants to take a look at how you might be having self-sabotaging behaviors that are, you know, keeping you from being happy and loved and successful in your life. I've got a list that outlines them right here and you can download that for free and I'll see you very soon.